accomplished this day, 2,000 years ago. Lord, that we can stand here and even pray a prayer like that and think about ourselves. I mean, that's such a miracle, Lord. That's, there's just so much there. So grateful, Lord. I know for myself, Lord, where would I be if, if you didn't rescue me? Dead. So, Father, I thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I thank you for being with us. Help us to understand, Lord. Help us to know. Help us to get it. Help us to do what you've called us to do. And Lord, please, Holy Spirit, please speak to us this morning. Nobody needs to hear from me, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Time I, every time I put a suit on, I got to hear all the mafia cracks <laughs> from you guys. <laughs> all right, where are we? Let me, let me get there. Say hello to somebody sitting next to you if you want to get there. So I just realized something. Uh, this is the first Easter I've done since 2020. It's the last time I was up here on an Easter Sunday. I wasn't up here. I was stuck in my office because it was COVID. And I had to do Easter, an Easter message, a Resurrection Sunday message from my desk. Me and Jerry hung out. That's how we started this whole thing with the putting it online, you know, we really got into it back then because we, we didn't have church, but I was so, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for that day because it was that day that I said, there's no way I can do church like this anymore. There's just no way. Uh, we, we opened up the following week because Easter was at the end of the month last, in that year, and we opened up the first Sunday in May. We were the first to open, huh? Remember? You remember that day? I thought I was getting arrested for sure that day. <clears throat> but God was faithful, and we've never, ever, we've never shut the ministry center down even for a, a, a minute. Um, we, we've had church ever since, and the Lord just gave us favor. The police actually came and were thanking us because they said they had nothing to do. They couldn't do anything but hand out Narcane. There was nothing for nobody. We ended up starting a our ministry, I mean, our um, recovery meeting in the back. We were the first to do that, too, after the COVID struck. And I'm just grateful, right? Amen? Amen. So we're here this morning. So I haven't been up here since 2020. I haven't been doing an Easter message since 2020. And I have to say, I've done lots of them over the years, and it's always hard. What are you going to say that you haven't said? And not to belittle or to water down this message, because there's just no way that you possibly can. It's the greatest message ever, right? It's the greatest story ever told. <clears throat> but to try to not be so redundant. So this year, I decided I'm not going to even talk about <laughs> too much. I'm going to talk about a resurrection before the resurrection. You know what I'm talking about? Well, you'll find out. So I want you to listen to some of the Easter traditions from different places in the world. You think we're nuts. In Australia, they replace chocolate bunnies with chocolate marsupials called bilbies. I guess there's nothing like eating a hamster ear, <laughs> chocolate hamster ear on Christmas. I mean, on Easter, that really says it, huh? In France, they celebrate by making the world's largest omelet with 4,500 eggs and feeding over 1,000 people. Listen to this. In Papua New Guinea, chocolate doesn't do well in Papua New Guinea because of the heat and humidity. So instead, churches are known to hand out tobacco and cigarettes to guests after the Easter service. <laughs> Nothing says Jesus like a good cigarette. 
in New Zealand, you guys are going to get mad at me at this. In New Zealand, instead of eating chocolate bunnies, <laughs> they grabbed their guns for the annual Great Easter Bunny Hunt <laughs> to rid their farmlands of these invasive pests. Over 10,000 rabbits will meet their maker today in New Zealand. <laughs> what the heck? What the heck? I mean, we're here to celebrate, to celebrate Resurrection Sunday, and this is what people do around the world. I don't know. So today, <laughs> we're going to try to do that. And I hope all these weird traditions, I know there's a, there's a lot more of them. I could have wrote, I looked on the internet, there's a ton. But there's a tradition I hope that never becomes weird for any of us. It's celebrating the un empty tomb year after year after year, every Resurrection Sunday. Yeah, you should clap for that. <clears throat> because remember, if Jesus didn't walk out that day, then that holiday... So many people go crazy over, and this one they kind of like glass over, called Christmas, is, is just a day. It's nothing. If it wasn't for this day, that day is meaningless. Just a great guy was born who had some cool things to say. It's this day that makes it. It's this day that is the reason all of us are new. It's this day that transformed the world. It's this day that saved a wretch like me. This day, hallelujah. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so today, I want to focus on Jesus, but I want to do it by focusing on another resurrection that doesn't typi typically get celebrated with its own holiday. But I think it's special because it shows us some incredible truths about Christ while pointing us to the resurrection that will take place later. So I want you to take your Bible out or your phone or whatever you got and please find your way to John chapter 11. In this passage, not only are we going to encounter a resurrection before the resurrection, but we're also going to encounter a Jesus who sees not only the brokenness of the world, but he absolutely positively does something about it. Amen? We're going to read verses 1 to 44. What? Can you handle that much scripture in one time? I don't know. John chapter 11, verses 1 to 44. You ready? I'm going to read it out of the New American Standard. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, him being Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said this, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that, when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, his, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that he said this to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of, out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of this death of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, "Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that he was not that I was not there, so that you may believe. 
but let us go to him. See what he just said to the disciples? He's the disciples. He said, I'm glad that, he's, that I'm not there so that you may believe. So even they're stumbling. Therefore, Thomas, who's called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. <laughs> That's a cool line. So that we may, because they thought he goes there, they're going to kill him. So when Jesus came, you got to give him some oomph for that though, right? He found that he had already been dead in, in the tomb four days. Four days. Now, you remember last week my wife talked about four days? From the triumphal entry to the crucifixion was four days. Lazarus now in the grave four days. When you, when you took the lamb, remember the sacrificial lamb, you had to hold it for how long? Four days. Four days. I got to look into that four days thing. I don't think it's a coincidence. I, I don't ever think this coincidence is in the Bible. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? How many times have we heard the word believe so far? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, the teacher is here and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up and quickly went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and the stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, tried said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you, all, I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. <clears throat> the man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face, was, his face was wrapped around with the cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's quite a story. That's quite a story. We're going to try to get into this. Is ready? So here it is. This is an awesome story of Jesus raising a person from the grave, raising a person from the dead. Stories like this should encourage us that he can help every person who what? Who what? Believes. Every person who believes. 
So this morning, I want to take a look at both the heart of Jesus and also the activity of Jesus, who was the power over sin, death, and hell. I'm going to give a couple points, maybe like three, I think. So number one, you ready? If you're writing down. Jesus is not indifferent to our brokenness. Let me say that again. Jesus is not indifferent to our brokenness. Guys, over the last few years, we've all had a front row seat to the suffering that comes with living in a world that's absolutely been cursed by sin. If that pandemic didn't show us anything, it showed the foul, <laughs> messed up place we are as people. We have seen some pretty incredible displays of suffering, division, and even hatred. A rock-solid case has been made that not, o- not only do we live in a fallen world, but church, we are a fallen people in need of redemption. The Bible teaches us that hardship and suffering exposes what's on the inside. And I don't know about the rest of you, but if I'm being really honest, I've learned some ugly things about myself over the last few years. So in the midst of all this brokenness, I think it's fair for people to ask this question. He's listening? Man, does Jesus even care? Does Jesus even care what's going on down here? Is God up there saying you made your bed, now lie in it? Or when he sees us hurting, does he look down and hurt too? I think if we can be really honest here this morning, sometimes it sure feels like maybe God's saying, it serves you right. It serves you right. Look what you've done. My generation, even the generation slightly under me, Look how we left this world for the future generation. Divided, full of hatred, a hot mess. So if you're struggling this morning here, if you're struggling this morning, here's some really good news for you. Are you ready? God can handle it if you ever doubt that he cares. I'll say it again. God can absolutely handle it if you ever doubt he cares. And I believe with all my heart that the reason God had this story written or recorded in John chapter 11 is to show us that we don't have to wonder about the heart of Jesus towards people whose hearts are broken. Can anybody here relate to that sentence? Whose hearts are broken? Look back to verses 32 and and to 35. Easter Sunday. What a day. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And he said this, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Jesus wept. John chapter 11, 35 is so much more than the answer to a trivial question about the shortest scripture in the Bible. There is so much there. There's a million sermons that with a million different things about why Jesus wept. So I'm going to talk about one that I chose this morning. I've, I've over the years, said other things because there's just so many reasons. But we're going to focus on what I want to focus on this morning. Is that all right? So John chapter eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. It's an incredible picture into the heart of Christ. As Christians, we believe that Jesus is both God and man, right? Is that what we believe? He's both God 
and man. As a man, he experienced temptation, pain, hunger, all the other things that human beings struggle with, all the stuff we experience. But as God, we know Jesus was all-knowing, right? Right? It wasn't a rhetorical question. You, you agree with that? So here's the problem then. If Jesus knows that he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead, <clears throat> why is he so deeply moved? Why is he so deeply moved? We already know that Jesus told his disciples what he was going to do. Didn't we? We just read that. So if Jesus is sovereign and he knows there's about to be a real happy ending, why is he moved to real tears? Well, the answer is simple, I think. Or maybe not so simple. Jesus cares deeply for people. He's not indifferent to our pain. He understands what we're going through. He weeps, church, when we weep. He understands the hardship of humanity. He's compassionate and gentle. He sees Mary and Martha and all of Lazarus' friends that are grieving, and what does he do? He weeps right along with them. And it doesn't say that his ear, that his eyes were watery, or that, you know, he was. <laughs> it says that he wept. If you look that word up, it was a sobbing, snot flying, ugly cry. He was weeping right along with his friend. And look at the response of the Jews who were watching, verse 36. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved them. See how he loved them. I have to say, Jesus is a lot, un, I'm, he's a way unlike me, I have to say that. I'm just not like that. There are times when I hear people's struggles or I watch some tragedy going on somewhere or wherever, and while I care about it, I do care about it, I'm not necessarily moved to tears. I'm not necessarily weeping like that. I care. But do I really care compared to him? In fact, my, my heart can be indifferent at times, if I'm honest. I don't know about you, but I know about me. But not Christ. Not Christ. Jesus always identifies with our pain and brokenness, and he cares deeply about what we're going through. But I also think that what's going on here is about more than just his friend's pain. The text says that Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Basically, what that means is that Jesus was really mad at death. Sadly, sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, and ever since, sin has been a part of our world. Let me read you something in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, if you want to look it up later. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So sin's been a problem ever since the garden. It's a big problem. As Jesus is standing before Lazarus' tomb, there's a lot more going on than just weeping for Lazarus. I think he's upset at the mess that sin has made of his creation. I think he could even be a little mad at it. So he weeps over the brokenness of his friends, but at the same time, church, he's weeping over our brokenness as well. Thank you, Lord. But here's the best part of this story. He doesn't just cry about it, like a lot of us. 
He doesn't just cry about it. And he takes action. He does something about it. Hallelujah. He does something about the brokenness that's in front of him. He's not content to give the old, I'm sorry for your lost speech. Jesus put legs under his love, and he proved to us that number two, he is able to overcome. Hallelujah. Let me ask you a question. On a very basic le level, what was Lazarus' real problem? Don't overthink it. He's dead. <laughs> That's his problem. He's dead. That's a big problem. It was the th same thing that many of us fear. Let's be honest. It's death. We fear death. Think of all the things we do to prevent that from happening. Think of all the things we do to prolong our lives. We try to eat better. We wear seat belts. We exercise. We take medication. We do all kinds of stuff. And generally speaking, we all try to care for our bodies. Why? So that we'll live longer. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to prolong death. But death has a 100% success rate. 100%. And there's really nothing that we can do about this problem. It's been said that death and taxes are the only sure things in life. In fact, like me, who waits till the last minute because I got to pay them guys, I wait to the 15th to pay my taxes which is coming right <laughs> next week. Thank you, whoever. This is what I want us all to believe. This is what I want us all to believe with all we got, church. There's a way to escape when it comes to death. Look at verses 38 and 39. Back to John 11. So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has already been dead. Four days. Now, can you imagine standing there in that moment? Put yourself in the story like I always say. Can you imagine standing there? Can you imagine being Mary and Martha? Your brother's been dead four days. He's in there. Four days. They've been weeping. People have been coming to the house. Back then, it was some of the other cultures. Some, you know, it goes on for a long time. You know your brother was buried in the tomb four days ago? And you have never ever in your life witnessed someone coming back to life. You've never seen anything like that in your entire life. So what? They doubted. They doubted. Why wouldn't they? Martha replies to Jesus' request by saying, by this time, there will be an odor. My favorite translation is, he stinketh. <laughs> he stinketh. That's probably an understatement, right? This is a dead man whose body has already started to decompose. Earlier when Jesus first arrived in town, Martha went out to meet him on the outskirts of town while Mary stayed home and grieved. Martha's first words were, if you would have been here earlier, if you would only gotten here on time, if you would have just shown up when you were supposed to, you could have healed them. But now, it's too late. Jesus responded by telling her that her brother will rise again. Let's be honest though here. Jesus liked to talk in riddles sometimes, didn't he? And Martha assumed Jesus meant Lazarus would rise again at the end times. 
she doubted Jesus. And for those of you thinking Christians should never doubt, we see it again in front of Lazarus' tomb. She cautions Jesus that her brother will stinketh. But listen to his response. He said, did I not tell you that if you believe, church, if we believe, you would see the glory of God. You would see the glory of God. I love how he addresses her doubts. You see, he doesn't condemn her form. He's not condemning you for yours. You see, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is unbelief. The opposite of faith is unbelief. See, if there wasn't any doubt, we would never really need faith, would we? In fact, that's what I love about this passage. Doubters are welcomed to approach Christ with their doubts. Am I talking to anybody here this morning? And look where her doubts come from. They come from the same place that ours come from when life starts to fall apart. When things just aren't going the way we hoped. When things aren't going the way we planned. When something happens that we just don't want to happen or when something's not happening that we desperately want to happen this is when doubt comes Martha's worst fears come true her brother who's still young by the way this is a young guy he was dead and Jesus let him down by getting there late even the Jewish mourners said this right they said couldn't he have healed that guy isn't that the guy that like opens up eyes? He could have did something. Where was he? Where was he? Why didn't he get here? They sent word. But Jesus' delay was not attributed to his indifference. In fact, the text says for a second time in verse 38 that Jesus was again deeply moved. So if he was so deeply moved, why did he delay? The answer is in the prayer he prayed as he stands in front of Lazarus' tomb. Verses 41 to 44. So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me and I knew that you always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth bound hand and foot with wrappings and his face was wrapped around with the cloth and Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Hallelujah. You see, Jesus wanted the bystanders, bystanders that day to believe that he was sent by God to come into this world to do what? To save people. Hallelujah. He wanted to come and make those who were dead come alive. I don't know about anybody in this room, but I was dead. I was dead, dead, and I was going to die. And Jesus made me alive. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And the same is true for every single solitary person sitting in this room today. He still wants people to believe that he has the power to overcome sin, death, and hell. That was the purpose of raising Lazarus from the dead. And that was God's purpose in raising Jesus from the dead on that first resurrection Sunday. Church, Jesus is able to overcome. That's the Christ. That's the Easter message. That's the Resurrection Sunday message. There's nothing that he can't handle in your life. Nothing. That's exactly what is illustrated here in John chapter 11. Easter is the answer to the three greatest problems that we all have this morning. You know what they are, right? 
the problem of sin that we cannot fix, the problem of death that we cannot escape, and the problem of hell that no one in this room wants to encounter. So please hear me this morning. Church, please hear me this morning. What Jesus did for Lazarus physically is what he wants to do for all of us spiritually. Help us, Lord. There are no limits to his amazing grace. There is no situation he cannot overcome. And no one is too far gone to experience his love, his mercy, and his grace. Thank you, Father. And in this story, Jesus does for Lazarus what Lazarus could not do for himself. And that's what he's still doing today for everyone who believes. Do you believe? Do you believe? He dies on the cross to pay the debt he did not know because he had, we had a debt that we could not pay. Sin not only rendered us hopeless, it rendered us helpless. Hopeless and helpless. Anyone ever feel like that in this room? Maybe there's someone who feels like that this morning. The world says you made your bed, now lie in it. But Jesus said, you made your bed and I'm willing to rescue you from it. Thank you, Lord. How awesome is Jesus? How awesome is Jesus? He who knew no sin became sin so that we might be made right with God through Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 And the resurrection of Lazarus, which points to the resurrection of Jesus, proves undoubtedly that he is able, undoubtedly, undeniably, that God is able. And if you believe this to be true, then 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, it can be your testament, testimony in your heart. Let me read this to you. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 57. You listening? Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Come on. Who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. So as we close here this morning, let me say something that may shock you. Can I say something that might shock you? You can agree with everything I just sta said, and you can still go to hell. You can agree with every single thing I said this morning, and you can still go to hell. And here's why. Number three, Jesus demands a response. Jesus demands a response. A response. John 11 is not primarily about Lazarus. It's not primarily about death. It's not primarily about sorrow. Jesus 11 is about Jesus who wants to involve himself in our lives. Thank you, Lord. It's about Jesus who wants to involve himself in everybody's life in this room. It's about Jesus, the only one who can solve our greatest problem of sin and death, and hell. What Jesus is doing here in John 11 is revealing a future reality. Lazarus' death and resurrection was a precursor of Jesus' death and resurrection. It was a preview, if you will, of coming attractions. See, a day was coming. A day was coming. In fact, we're celebrating it here today. When Jesus would once again show his power over sin, his power over death, and his power over hell by walking out of that tomb that day. Thank you, Lord. So listen to his words again to Martha. John 11. Verses 25 and 26. 
Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe? Do you believe? And so I want to ask us that very same question this morning. Do you believe? I'm not asking, do you agree? I'm not asking you, do you agree? I'm asking you, do you believe? Even to the point of surrender. Even to the point of surrender. One of the saddest things for me personally is to encounter people that agree intellectually that Jesus is able, that Jesus is alive, they believe in him, they agree. But they aren't willing to believe to the point that they surrender their lives around that truth. Many people live their lives as Jesus fans. He doesn't need a fan club. He's not looking for a fan club. He's looking for committed followers. And he invites us all to believe to the point of surrender. He's not a get out of hell free card. Like so many people try to use him. Heaven is not a place for people who don't want to go to hell. Heaven's a place for people who love Jesus as evidence by their obedience to him. I just said something there, church. I just said something there. You see, that's what it means to believe. That's what it means to believe. Do you believe him this morning? This morning, maybe you're here and you can identify with Mary and Martha. Maybe you're struggling because someone you love is struggling. Or maybe you feel like God's not showing up on time. Where are you at, God? Don't you see what's going on in my life? Don't you care? Oh, he cares. He cares. If that's you, be encouraged. That while Jesus rarely shows up early, <laughs> he never shows up late. <laughs> he never shows up late. Late on maybe on my time, but never late on his time. And better yet, he's not indifferent to the pain of those who seek refuge and comfort in him. He loves you. He gave us a double yes to that. Did you see that? <laughs> so be encouraged, church, that when you hurt, he hurts. And when, <laughs> and when you weep, he weeps. But maybe this morning you're like Lazarus. Can we be honest this morning? Your problem is that you're dead. You feel dead. You feel spiritually dead. You're dead in your trespasses. Maybe you're dead in your sin. You know it. You know it. But here's the good news of this day too. Jesus is so able. Jesus is so able to raise you from the dead. There's no question about that. The only question is this. Do you believe? Do you believe enough to surrender your life to him? So I'm going to ask you guys. Maybe there's some of you here this morning. You got doubts. You got doubts, man. Where you at, God? Where you been? Don't you see what's going on in my life? Don't you see how long? How long am I not going to be healed? How long am I going to deal with this stuff? How long? How long am I going to be alone? How long? Don't you love me? Don't you care? Maybe you're like Mary and Martha. And maybe there's somebody here this morning who, quite frankly, you know, man, you haven't been doing what you're supposed to do. You're like Paul in chapter 7 of Romans. Everything I'm supposed to do, I don't do. Everything I know I should do, I don't do. And everything I know I shouldn't do, I do do. 
Maybe that's you. You're in good company. Paul was struggled with the same thing. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're feeling like a little dead spiritually. And it's because of sin. And then maybe there's somebody here this morning who never asked Jesus into their heart. Who never really made that commitment. But again, this is all about recommitting ourselves. Why? Because we believe. So if I spoke to anybody here this morning, could you stand, please? Could you stand up? If that's you, stand up. Don't be shy. Don't worry about who's around you. Look at that. Look at that. Is there anybody that stood up here? There's a few of you now here. Is there anybody here that stood up who's never accepted Christ into the heart? Could you raise your hand? Number one, oh, my man. Anybody else who's never done it? Who's never? And then the rest of you want to read that. Because stand up, buddy. They ain't done with you yet. Come on, stand up, my man. My man raised his hand and sat down quick. I won't make a spectacle of you. Yeah, okay. Sure. I won't, I promise. What did he say? Well, I'm glad you stopped, Joe. And so the rest of us, we need to rededicate our lives to the Lord. Amen? So my man, I'm going to say a prayer, and I want you to say it with me. Repeat after me, and the rest of you, you can too. What's your name again? Jacob? Jacob, man, what a name. Holy cow, you need to find out what that name means, Bill. Jacob. You ready, Jacob? And the rest of you can say it too. Dear Lord, I'm so grateful for this day. I'm so grateful for what you've done on the cross. I'm so grateful, Lord, that you can take someone like me who's dead and bring him to life. Father, I, give, I submit my life to you. Jesus, I make you my Lord and I thank you for being my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes! Woo! Jacob! I got to say it. The Bible says if one person gives their heart to the Lord, the angels rejoice. In other words, they are partying in heaven for you, bud. And for the rest of you that stood up, thank you. It was awesome. What a beautiful day. This is the day of days, guys. You know, it, it always bothers me. And I love Christmas. I'm a Christmas nut. I decorate. I do all that stuff. But some people start preparing for Christmas in January. They put themselves in debt. They, some people work second jobs just so they can, you know, bury themselves in gifts. All these things. And it would be nothing. It wouldn't even matter. It wouldn't even be significant if it wasn't for this day. This is the day we should be preparing for. This is the day we should make a big deal out of. This is it. This is it. This was the Super Bowl. Evil. Good clashed, and good busted evil. Busted them up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let me just pray. Father, I thank you for what you did for us. Lord, I don't think we'll ever comprehend it until we're with you. But Lord, if you didn't do it, there's no way we'd be with you. Lord, it's all about you. Man, you've been doing it forever. You're still doing it. Father, I bless you this day. I thank you so much, Lord. I pray a blessing over everybody here this morning. Bless their day. But Lord, more than anything, let us never take for granted what you've done for us. Lord, let us never take for granted for this day, Resurrection Sunday, when you walked out of the tomb with the keys of death in your hand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Father. Help us, Lord.
to understand how much we're loved. Help us, Lord, to understand who we are. Thank you, Lord. Now, we're going to have communion real quick. Today we're having uh, matzah instead of bread. Yeah, it seems apropos. So if you can stay. Listen, if you're visiting, you believe in Jesus. You believe that he's born on a cross. I mean, born in a manger, died on a cross, raised to from the dead, see that at the right hand, you're welcome to join us this morning. So just hang out a couple minutes.